one sheet of paper, it's all you need. All right, welcome back to the New Nurse Guidebook. My name is Pierre Lafour. If you're new to the channel, the purpose of this video is to help new graduate nurses live healthier, wealthier, and happier, more fulfilling lives. Today, what I'd like to talk about is my method for writing a handoff sheet. A handoff sheet is very important because it gives you uh, a snapshot of your patient when you're receiving handoff. Don't worry, there'll be a future video on how to crush giving handoff. So the first thing I like doing is getting a blank sheet of paper. Boom, like this. I call this the naked warrior method, akin to the naked warriors who were the predecessor to the frogmen, who were the predecessor to the Navy SEALs. Um, and the reason I do that is because I can walk into any situation. I could be floated to a different floor where I don't have a standard handoff sheet. I could be clocking in right at 7 a.m. and walking in and I just grab a blank sheet of paper off the printer and boom, I'm ready to hit the ground running and going no matter what environment I'm in at work because every day is different and you never know what you're gonna get into. So I get a blank sheet of paper, I fold it in half, that'd be hamburger style, and then I fold it again, and I'll edit that out. Fold it right there, fold it there, and then you fold it again, boom, like that. And then one more time, and then what you end up with is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight nice little squares. So to save you from having to squint on the video, I've created a visual representation on my favorite thing in the world, a whiteboard. So what I like to do is I like to break each square into little systems and information. So first thing I like doing is doing a nice little dotted line right here. And then I'll usually write the patient's name. Let's say John Johnson. And then I'll do their age. So we'll say 67 year old male. And then we'll do his code status, which would be, let's say for this one, full code. And then any pertinent allergies. Let's say he's allergic to penicillin and oxycodone. And then so boom, that's a little snapshot of my patient. And then also he's a patient of Dr. Magoo, Dr. Magoo, which added in there. It's not the end of the world if it goes over the line. So then we're gonna do past medical, medical history. So on January the 6th, he was admitted for an atrial valve replacement, a tricuspid valve repair, and a bypass times four. He has, and then down here I like to jot down their medical history. He has past medical history of hypertension, coronary arterial disease, COPD, uh, what's another common one, hyperlipidemia, and he um, is obese. Now, what I like doing in these sections is breaking them down like this. I draw a little heart, boom. That's everything pertaining to the patient in the cardiac realm. Then we'll do respiratory, neuro, GI, GU, so that's stomach, bowels, and bladder. And then we're gonna do skin, drips, and access. So that's a pretty decent snapshot of everything you'll need on the patient. Now we'll kind of go through an example dry run of it and um, just get, get to give you an idea of what you would write in each one of these squares that way you kind of get an idea so for cardiac you know he's in normal sinus rhythm so I'll just write an SR and then his math goals are 65 to 75 his pulses are palpable I like putting that under um, cardiac and what else is there? And then I'll jot other things down. Let's say he has a swollen line for hemodynamic monitoring. I'll jot down, you know, his CVP, little five, and then his uh, pulmonary artery pressure, let's say quarter, let's say 25 over 10. And then, you know, 
And then usually the handoff range will be like, oh, it's been normal sinus rhythm in the 70s to 80s. His maps have been anywhere from 75 to 95. And if you had a pacemaker, I'd toss it up here. And then pacer. It's always very important when somebody has a pacemaker to get the settings. So is the pacemaker for the atrium in their heart? Is it for the ventricle or is it both? For this one, we're gonna pretend that it's both. So his pacemaker settings are DGD, and we'll say 60 to 180. And it's a permanent pacemaker. We'll get into pacer boxes later on. I'm gonna get one and do a show and tell and explain some of it and my understanding of it. Uh, respiratory, so now we're going on respiratory on him. Let's say that he is still on the ventilator. He just came out of the operating room. So I'll write vent. And then it's very important you know, ventilators is a ethereal concept, but it's very important that you take note of what ventilator settings your patient's on. So let's say he's on an oxygen concentration of 50% FiO2, and then he's on a peak, peak expiratory end pressure of five. Let's say he's got a set respiratory rate at 20, and, let's, and another important thing is tidal volumes. What are the set tidal volumes or what is he currently breathing? It's important to take note of that as well. Um, respiratory wise, any other miscellaneous stuff, maybe he has some secretions. I like to put a little reminder star that he has COPD here, just in case, you know, touch base if you're like, huh, we extubate him and he's on a nasal cannula and he's like low on two liters nasal cannula. Maybe, oh yeah, he has COPD and I have it handy right there, not just in my medical history. Neurologically, so we did a sedation vacation on him and he is ANO times four. He's able to nod his head appropriately when I'm asking him questions and he's intubated. He follows commands appropriately. His pupils are equal, round and reactive. So I'll do Perla, P-E-R-L-A. Any other neuro abnormalities? No, okay. Let's say he had a stroke or something like that. I would take note of, um, you know, he has a stroke in his, dips, in his right arm and that's baseline. So I'd do like right arm, C-V-A. Just like a little snapshot of the patient. G-I-G-U, he has a fully catheter in place. He is receiving Lasix two times a day, and he puts out anywhere from 200 to 500 mLs an hour. So I'll do 200 to 500. And then bowel and bladder, uh, hypoactive because he just had open heart surgery. He's been NPO, hasn't been eating anything. So we'll do um, uh, hypoactive. Uh, what's his dietary status right now? Well, currently he is NPO because he's intubated. He's a standard bread and butter cardiac patient. We're planning on extubating him later. And then he also has an OG tube, an oral gastric tube in place. And it's hooked up to low intermittent suction. And it's been putting out anywhere from 10 to 20 mLs an hour. And the color of it is, uh, let's say, brown. Skin. Any skin abnormalities going on? I also like to toss my, um, if they have a chest tube in place, I'll put that there. So let's say he has a mid-sternal incision because he just had an open heart surgery. He has a right pleural chest tube and a left pleural chest tube. And they both have been putting uh, the right pleural's been putting out 20 mLs an hour on average, and the chest and the left pleural has been putting out 30 mLs an hour on average. And uh, serosanguinous, and they're both to low intermittent suction with a water seal back up in the atrium. So usually I'll just keep that in the back of my mind. Um, that's usually like standard, and if they have something else where it's like, oh, the, this left pleural chest tube is to water seal and no suction then I'll take note of that. Any other skin abnormalities? He has a bruise on his right 
butt cheek. So boom, I've got a snapshot of his skin. Drips. Okay, so he is intubated, which means we're either, he's probably on some sort of sedation or anesthesia to keep him comfortable. So let's say he's on propofol at 50. And then uh, let's say he's also on levofed or norepinephrine to keep his blood pressure up. Your facility may do a weight-based titration of levofed or they may do just a standard straight rate. Me personally, I grew up and was accustomed to a straight rate. So in that case, let's just say he's on four of levofed at standard concentration. And then he also has a KVO, keep, keep vein open, and I'll make a little short video on that, at five. Awesome. So now, last but certainly not least, we have access. Access, he has a, a swan in his right IJ. So I'll do right IJ swan, and it has a cordis. A cordis is just a thick line on a swan for giving a lot of fluid. Let's say he has an 18 gauge in the left forearm. So I'll do left forearm, 18 gauge and he has a 20 gauge in the right hand. All right, you might be thinking to yourself, Pierre, what about labs? What if there's an abnormal lab? Well, if the labs are normal, I'll typically not take note of it and I can always pull it up in the chart later. But if there's something to take note about, I'll usually jot it down right here next to my drips. So let's say that John's hemoglobin was 7.1 and it's been trending downward. I'll just make a quick little note of that, 7.1. Other big lab to take note of, potassium and magnesium, especially potassium in cardiac patients. Let's say his potassium was 3.1 and they replaced it and they said keep an eye on it on his next, um, on his next uh, potassium drop, whether that's through an ABG or you're sending off a lab. ABG is a fancy word for arterial blood gas. So any extra side note labs that I need to take note of that they tell me during handoff or I notice when I'm doing a little chart spelunking. Um, this is my workflow for getting a report sheet on the patient. So then, boom, I've got a blank one right here. So I've got all the information filled out. And I've got one for my one patient and the other side for my other patient. And then what I like to do is turn it around and I have a nice little chart, which is right here. And what this chart does is it does a few things. It organizes your shift into times and it also helps you with eyes and nose. If you stay on top of eyes and nose and you ever get behind in charting and nursing, as long as you're staying up with your eyes and nose, nine times out of 10, you can catch up on the rest of it. So, for this, let's imagine we're working night shift. So I'm going to do the hours up here, 19, 20, 21, and this is military time, 22, 23, 24, or 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And then he has a Foley catheter. He has a right pleural chest tube and a left pleural chest tube. And then Let's say they want me to draw an arterial blood gas. He's due for another one at 20 under it. So I just do a little note of ABG in here. And if there's any other things, grab a shift that I need to do. Or let's say he has a bowel movement right here at midnight and we have to clean that up. I can just jot a little note of both bowel movement. And it gives me a nice snapshot of how the shift is going and progressing. And then up here, I'll write his bed space. So we'll do bed space number five, John Johnson. And I like to do a five here, I forgot about that. And so it gives me a nice snapshot. The next thing that I like doing with this back piece, piece of paper is writing down medication administration. I like to write down a quick note. It gives me a nice snapshot of what scheduled medications I have to get from throughout the day. So typically on a night shift, your first medication window, I would say is 2,000 to 2,100. Let's say he's getting aspirin. 
He's getting Senecot, which is just a stool softener to help him poop. And he's getting, I don't know, what's uh, Lipitor. So, aspirin would be, this is typically standard in all post-cardiac recovery patients. But one big thing that I learned as a new graduate is let's say you have some medications that are scheduled for 2,000, 2,100. If you were to do it very straight line, you know, I give my aspirin that's scheduled at 2,000 at 2,000, and I give my Lipitor that's scheduled at 2,100 at 2,100, you're gonna be at the bedside potentially all day, especially if you're in med surge and step down. So what you typically do to be more time management oriented is you can cluster these medications together unless they're time sensitive where it's required that you have to give it right at this specific hour at this specific time. And that would be more for like something with a, a transplant patient who's receiving um, Tafro, which is a special medication to make sure they don't reject the transplanted organ. You know, putting those cases aside, is it going to make or break John if he gets his Lipitor for his cholesterol an hour earlier? Probably not. So it's okay to cluster your meds into the span of like 2,000 to 2,100. Um, and most hospitals, check with your policy, but typically you have a, an hour to an hour and a half of flexibility where you can give them scheduled medication either an hour and a half early before the scheduled time or an hour and a half after the scheduled time. And that's to give you a little margin window for giving medications. So now I've got a nice beautiful handoff sheet that pretty much only I can read and now you can because you know how to do it. And I have a sheet that will record eyes and O's and give little updates throughout the shift on the patient. I also have track of my medications and everything. And the beauty of this is I can make this on the fly no matter what care environment I'm. I go to med search, guess what? I can do it on four patients. One, two, three, four. I don't have this luxury of having this chart, but that's okay. Because typically I can just write on a sticky note the meds because they just have usually one evening med pass. And this is the method that has worked for me and served me well. If this method for writing handoffs and intakes and outputs in the ICU works for you, then more power to you. And if you have a different method that you prefer, more power to you either way. If you found this video beneficial, and you learned something from it, or you learned a little skill that maybe, I didn't like everything you did, but I like this little element of his report sheet. I wanna add that to mine. Uh, be sure to like the video, and if you know anybody else who would benefit from this content and information, be sure to share it. Um, this is Pierre LaFour signing off with the New Grad Nurse Guidebook. I'll see you in the next one.